Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Alta Live. I am Mary Melton, an editor at large here at Alta Journal, and I am happy to welcome you here today. Uh, before I introduce you to our wonderful guest, Mr. David Eulen, um, let me introduce you to Alta. For those of you who may not be familiar with Alta, uh, the journal and our online world, um, and also to cover just a couple of bits of very quick housekeeping. So Alta Live is the digital interview series that we do here at Alta Journal. And if you are unfamiliar with Alta, we are, and I have one handy right here, our latest issue, an award-winning quarterly magazine. Uh, we come out um, every season with a new issue devoted to stories about California and the West. And we update our website much more frequently than that. Uh, right now we have a really fascinating serial going on. We've been dabbling with serials lately, which has been really fun um, that are updated weekly. So check those out. Uh, you can join us as a member for as little as $3 a month. So it's a really great deal uh, to support the work that we do, uh, which also includes our California book club, which is free and very, very fun to join. Next week, uh, our stellar lineup uh, will be Charles Yu, who's going to be talking about his really um, genre bending uh, National Book Award winning uh, Interior Chinatown. We've just had a spectacular lineup of writers um, in California Book Club. So please join us next Thursday for that, which I think is June 15th at five o'clock. And we'll send you a link uh, to that after this um, after this call. Um, but if you haven't joined us yet as a member um, and have been considering it, I really, I really encourage you to do so. Um, so thanks in advance um, for any new members who we may um, have on this call. As for this call today, please use the Q&A button that's down there at the bottom of the screen to ask any questions that you may have for our guests as they come up. We'll be monitoring that. And then at the end of the call, we will uh, invite in more questions and, and throw some to David. Um, we're going to be chatting for just about 30 minutes, just under 30 minutes. David has to get to a class. Uh, he's a prof, so we've got to let him go. But um, we'll be wrapping it up by probably more like 25 minutes and then have the last five minutes or so for questions. All of this, however, is going to be recorded and posted on altaonline.com later today. So you'll be able to review it so you don't have to scribble notes furiously. We also uh, send you an email afterwards with a link to the video uh, to Airlight's uh, website, which we're going to be talking about today, and also with invites for upcoming events. And we do a little recap of what happened on this call. So if David mentioned or I mentioned anything that uh, we refer to as a link, that'll be on there as well. So you don't have to worry about that. And we'd love to hear from you uh, actually right off at the top of this call. We always love starting these calls to find out where you are logging in from. So please use the chat to tell us where you are. So now I'm going to move on to our guest, David Yulin, who has been a friend and a colleague of mine for, oh my gosh, David, like, I think it's been a couple of decades almost at this point. At this point. Um, yeah, it's been a long time. Um, a wonderful time. I'm so treasured. Uh, I so treasure our, our friendship and, and, and working, being able to work together. So a quick recap of David's resume, for those of you who may not be familiar um, with it, which is probably very few of you, but in addition to serving as Alta's book editor, David is the author and editor of a dozen books from the selected works of Joan Didion, which he edited for Library of America, I believe that was, uh, to Sidewalking, which is one of my favorite books of, of David's about walking in LA, but about so much more than that, uh, to the more recent, The Lost Art of Reading, Books and Resistance in Troubled Time to numerous essays and works of criticism. He's a professor uh, at U USC, which is a connection that we have here today to talk about Airlight, um, and also the founder and editor of this online quarterly journal that he started in 2020. Um, and one of my later questions for you, David, is how in the world do you find any time to actually read anything, considering how much you write and how much you do? But maybe we'll save that question for, for later. Uh, but I do want to start with Airlight. Um, it's published under the auspices of USC, so maybe you can give us a little bit more context about that. And as I mentioned, it was launched in the fall of 2020. And just for anyone who maybe hasn't seen it, I just wanted to just give folks a sense of what was in that first volume. And pardon me for getting a little listy here, David, but let me consult my list. Um, you had elegant essays in that issue on earthquakes and the passage of time. You had a short story about helicopters. Uh, you had another short story about a nervous breakdown at a Guadalajara boutique. Um, there was an essay on borders by frequent ultra contributor and wonderful writer Susan Strait. You had recent work by five poets. And there was even a short libretto that was um, kind of as bloody as a, a Wagner opera uh, that was capped by a metaphorical cuckoo clock. 
Um, and I would say the most recent volume of Air Light, which was published for winter spring, furthers that eclectic tradition. So I want to start off by just asking, as a reader, I found Air Light to be very stimulating and very surprising and sometimes even a little confounding in the best way that I think a literary journal should be. Um, but if the goal was to widen a reader's perspective, it really worked. I don't know if that was your goal. So what was your goal in launching Air Light? Well, <clears throat> thank, uh, first of all, thank you for doing this, uh, Mary, and thanks to, uh, to Alta for, for um, supporting um, both you know, my work with Alta and also other work of mine. I'm delighted to be here talking about the magazine. The goal is always to kind of open up, or for me at least, is always to kind of open up and hope, as you say, hopefully confound in the best way readers' expectations. Um, when we first started talking about the journal, we knew we wanted to do something online. Partly that was uh, a matter of economics. We wanted to be able to, you know, we have we have a budget. We're published uh, under the auspices of the English department at USC, um, but budgets never stretch far enough. And we wanted to make sure we were we were able to pay writers for work. Um, so we are paying, you know, every piece that runs in Airlight we pay for, it, including um, the poets always react with great shock. We pay we pay for poetry. <laughs> um, what? But but the other thing that was really interesting about online was we wanted to think about um, sort of online as its own kind of as its own platform as its own venue and so we wanted to do a traditional literary magazine with issues in the way that you know would be recognizable to people who read um, literary magazines you know kind of eclectic publishing fiction nonfiction poetry um, some sort of bigger critical pieces not reviews per se but sort of critical think pieces in that very first issue for instance there was a fantastic essay by Wendy Ortiz about pandemic tv watching and which was a really relevant piece in October of 2020 when we launched um, the journal but we also wanted to think about what we could do um that was really kind of you know endemic or inherent to online publishing so that would include you know videos or we've published published music and at the moment we're kind of going back and forth about trying to do a music issue and ideally that would include music and some performance videos as well as writing about music and things like that and so you see that in that first issue that libretto and that kind of dance piece that it was a libretto for that we we published the video of the dance piece, we published the text of the libretto, and then we did a kind of interview that I did with both uh, um, the librettist or the librettist, whatever that word is, uh, who is the poet um, Douglas Kearney, who's uh, one of my favorite, now he's in Minnesota, but he was a longtime professor at Cal Arts. Um, and also, um, and also Andre uh, Tyson, who had been the the curia, the, pardon me, the, the choreographer of the piece about kind of the genesis of it. We were really interested in the idea that that was a kind of literary performance piece in a certain way, or a collaborative performance piece, and but with a literary component. And rather than simply publishing um, Doug's uh, Doug's libretto as a text in its own right, we were we were able to quote unquote, publish the whole uh, the whole dance piece. So we've gotten really interested in that, um, the idea of how literature can uh, both be presented in traditional ways, but also in ways that kind of break down boundaries or blur boundaries or surprise readers and hopefully ourselves in terms of, um, of how it's infiltrating into other territories. Did you see a white space maybe that you felt like it was filling? Uh, yes, I, I mean, you know, I had been involved. Uh, one of my great inspirations, I will say, for this magazine was uh, was Black Clock, which was Steve Erickson's magazine that was published out of Cal Arts for for a long time. Um, it wasn't meant to fill that gap exactly, but as you know, I've been aware for I've been in Southern California um, for over thirty years, and I've been aware in that period of of a kind of what I think I think there's a dearth of sort of literary journals in Southern California. There, I mean, there's some really really good ones, but there's not really that kind of critical mass that there is in in sort of in the bay area certainly in the east coast um and literary publishing in general so we definitely thought about uh, without thinking too specifically about an individual um you know replacing an individual visual journey or, or filling a particular corner of white space we're very aware of the fact that there were you know limited literary publications um, coming out of Southern California, and we wanted to kind of do something. Um, we wanted to do something about that, in part because the region is so vibrant in terms of its literary culture, um, and also because it's so kind of um, I don't want to quite say overlooked, but let's say underestimated nationally in terms of of its literary power. I mean, it's, it is a literary powerhouse of a journey, as is the entire state. 
Um, and so we wanted not necessarily to create a journal to showcase Southern California writers, although that's definitely part of our mandate, but to really kind of publish from Southern California with a Southern California sensibility, um, which I think is unique and different from other sensibilities. And, um, and I also think essential in many ways, not just aesthetic ways, also political and cultural and social ways, but we wanted to sort of represent that California, that Southern California point of view. Let's dig into that a little bit because Airlight is so clearly, I think, a product of the California experience, which can be hard to define. Um, I think especially hard to define by people on the outside, which you and I could probably talk about for two or three days, uh, let alone hours. Or even weeks. <laughs> Maybe weeks. Um, but at the same time, like Airlight is in no way provincial because it's much too ambitious for that. So how do you strike that delicate balance? How do you define that California aesthetic without it actually overtly being about California? That's an excellent question, and I'm not sure I know how to answer it, but I'll try. Um, I mean, on the first in the first place, we're not necessarily thinking consciously. There's definitely a kind of one, as you as you know from editing, there's definitely a kind of subconscious or intuitive component to kind of, you know, to what we get. Obviously, <clears throat> as a publication, we're reliant on what comes in. So we, you know, we have uh, you know, we have you know, people submit work. We have, um, you know, unsolicited submissions. We certainly go out and solicit work from writers who we want to work with. Um, but we're kind of, you know, it, it's interesting. We're, in the first case, we're putting each issue together in the way that I've always put issues together, which is as a kind of conversation um, between the voices of all the writers who are there. We want the issue to have a kind of a narrative arc or a sort of a coherent sensibility, not necessarily. We don't, we're not, as I said, we haven't really done theme issues, although we're thinking about doing a couple, but we want the issue to hang together. So part of it is how those pieces are in conversation with each other. But, you know, I think just as part of, let's say, the water we're swimming in or the air we're breathing, you know, Southern California in particular and California in general is itself a kind of eclectic international series of overlapping communities. I mean, think about just how many languages are spoken in, in you know, mm -hmm. in, in the city of Los Angeles alone. So for us, being Southern, being a California publication means that we are inevitably an international publication because, um, that's where we're living. That's where we're publishing. That's what we're responding to. Um, so I think that it it it, it just kind of came with the brief in a certain in a certain sense. It's not um, we're aware of it and we're thinking about it, and we definitely do push back on occasion when people sort of try to say, "Oh, they're just they're just a Southern California magazine." Not because it, there's any issue, not, not because we think Southern California itself is a diminution, but it be, we believe that that diminu uh, minimizes kind of the cultural impact of Southern California as a essentially as what you know it is essentially a city state at this point. Yeah, I get a little bored. I don't know about you, David, by the reinvention thing about about people coming here to, to reinvent themselves. But something I never get bored of is the idea that you can be whatever you want to be here, like pedigrees don't matter here and you can take chances. And Sam Dunn, I noticed in the chat, commended you for bringing up Black Clock and noted how they really took a lot of chances, a lot of literary chances, um, you know, with, with, with that publication. It feels like that's a similar um, calling for you with with Airlight. And do you have that same sense of like, does that translate? I mean, it certainly translates to all kinds of arts, but I would assume literature as well, where there's more of an openness to risk taking um, in in California and the sensibility and, and how that translates with Air, into Airlight. Without question. And that is <clears throat> definitely something we're thinking about. I mean, I always think about I grew up in New York and I one of the things I I mean, it, this sounds shallow, but it's really not one of the things I love the most about living in Southern California is I can't remember the last time someone asked me where I went to college. So great. Um, I love that. You know, it does. None of that stuff matters. And I feel the same. I mean, I came out a, as a writer. I pro I don't know that I would have had been the writer I became if I had not come to California. I certainly wouldn't have um, done deep research nonfiction. I would have never written a book about earthquakes. I didn't know anything about earthquakes. I wouldn't have felt that I had the space to try a project like that and fail if I needed to fail. And I feel that something is similar with Aerolite that, you know, we have, um, because we're not, um, because I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to privilege New York too much, but because we're not in New York, we're not in, in and, and and we have space to kind of mess around a little bit. You know, we have space to experiment. We have space to try something. 
Um, and if it doesn't work, we can adjust and make some kind of uh, move. We also have a, um, a fairly, a, a pretty small staff. We've just expanded a little bit, but for a long time, it was really two of us putting the magazine together with a couple of interns here and there. Um, so we really could be very nimble if we wanted to, uh, because we are affiliated with the English department at USC. We have just added a, a, an associate editor tier um, with, with two funded positions for PhD students. And that's also, um, something. I mean, we're not necessarily existing as a pedagogical institution, but the idea of being able to bring along young editors and work with them and and um, and kind of mentor them and hone their chops is something that's really, really exciting to me about the magazine. And also, and part of that includes incorporating their sensibilities. They are in all sorts of communities and know all sorts of writers that I know nothing about. And I'm just mm -hmm. excited. Part of it for me going to, you know, to sort of maybe jump your question about reading is one of the things I love about doing a magazine like this and this magazine is particular is, in particular is that I'm constantly being exposed to writers I didn't know before mm -hmm. and that is the you know as you know as, as a devoted reader yourself like that's that's the reader's fantasy really you know um, and then to have a place to showcase some of that work it just is um, it's a gift I am grateful for pretty much every day. Yeah, that's exactly how I would describe it. That is such a gift because um, you would think it's so easy to find writers because writers are accessible. But at the same time, it's it like to actually discover new voices and to be exposed to them like that is is fantastic. Uh, in talking about the students, Airlight has the the immediacy of a digital publication, but at the same time, you publish it as a quarterly. So it's kind of like the slow motion literary journals of the analog age. I wonder if there's a conflict in there somewhere and how the students have re re respond to that. Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's an interesting process. So what we did at the beginning um, was to, to, you know, to set it up was we like the, I mean, we like traditional literary journals. I mean, we wanted this magazine to reflect a traditional literary journal. We wanted it to be a magazine. Um, and I think a website can be a magazine, but it is not necessarily a magazine. At the same time, we didn't want to do something where, you know, every quarter we were, you know, doing a data dump and public putting up 27 pieces and then the site would be static for three or four months until we did another issue. So the solution that we came up with was to try and create a hybrid model that was hopefully the best of both worlds. It, it, for, from where we sit, it seems to be working out. We've gotten good feedback on it. We've honed it a little here and there. So what we do is we, we put together an issue and we announce the entire issue at the beginning of the cycle. Um, you know, we publish, we'll, we'll announce and publish the list of contributors and um, the first week of the cycle, when we first begin to post pieces, we'll also publish the full table of contents. So everybody can see what's coming. Um, within that framework, we publish, we usually the first week we publish, we publish four or five pieces to launch with a splash. And then over about 10 weeks, 11 weeks, we publish two pieces a week um, so that we, as and, and then the issue fills out. We turn the links live on the table of contents on the website as each piece posts. And at the end of the cycle, I call it the cycle because I think that's how I think of it. At the end of that 10, 11, 12 week cycle, the full issue has been posted online. At that point, uh, we give it a couple of weeks so that we can catch our breath. And then we end up creating a downloadable PDF of the entire issue. If you want to read it as a traditional kind of literary journal on your, on your device. Uh, but the, but the, but the issues itself are up there. For us, that's been um, that's meant that we can be nimble in that sense that a website is with that, you know, with that once weekly publication. It also means we're curating in two different ways. We're curating that the entire issue as an issue, but we're also curating each week as a kind of mini issue, like what, what pieces go well together, um, what week should follow, you know, what, what should follow this week. We'll, we'll you know have these, you know, if we have this, whatever, if we have a short story and a poem this week, then probably the next week we're going to follow maybe with an essay and a, or maybe a visual piece or something like that. So we're thinking about trying to think about it both in kind of the micro and the macro. And that seems to have been pretty effective for us, both in terms of that issue integrity, but also using the mechanics of the web in the way that they're meant to be used. The other thing I should add quickly is that we have a, a side bar kind of section, which we call ETC, which if we were a print publication would be our blog. Um, but since we're not a print publication, we don't quite have a label for it. But that's a place where, you know, we don't publish, uh, that's a place where we'll publish smaller essays or maybe, you know, have um, a graduate student write a critical piece or some kind of found stuff. We've now got an editorial assistant, uh, a, a USC alum who's living in Brooklyn, who is kind of curating um, sort of indie 
publication stuff for us from the East Coast, which also opens up our geography. And a lot of those pieces are, are showing up in, um, in ETC as well. So we have a number of different channels, I guess I would say, in terms of how we put work out into the world. Let's talk about the name Airlight. Okay. Um, the name, you know, so I, I, I'm terrible with titles. I will just say that, you know, really? one of my favorite things about being a journalist was that I never had to worry about titles. I could, <laughs> you know, I just sort of let the, let the copy desk or the editor figure out the title. Um, but we knew we wanted, <clears throat> again, we wanted a name that reflected the sensibility or the vibe of the place um, without, and we wanted a name that was a little amorphous in some way. So the phrase airlight comes from an essay, uh, that Lawrence Weschler published in the, New Yorker in the late 90s about light, about Southern California light. A lot of it involves his conversation, well, with a bunch of people. He talks to Don Waldy, he talks to um, Robert Irwin, he talks to a lot of people about how the light works and and he is talking to uh, an atmospheric scientist at one point um, about the phenomenon of um, there's that phenomenon of haze, let's say in Los Angeles, where all of a sudden, you know, you'll, things will white out or you won't, or Southern California, things will white out and you don't see and, the, the, um, and I'm going to paraphrase this badly, but I definitely recognize, uh, I definitely recommend reading Weschler's um, piece. So the, the atmospheric scientist says to him, um, do you want to know what that's called? And Weschler says yes, and he gets his pen out and he's all ready for, you know, some big scientific uh, phrasing. And the, and the scientist says it's called air light. <laughs> what that means is that um, air, part, the particles, the molecules of air in Southern California are bigger than they are in, in some other places. It's not the only place where that's true. So depending on how the molecule is canted in the air, it either can um, facilitate the passage of light or facilitate clarity, or it can reflect back and, and, and facilitate a kind of um, obfuscation. And I just think that is the best metaphor for Southern California I've ever heard in my life. Um, also, because air and light is so important in Southern California all over the place, it does, it it felt like it, it again, it's a kind of a metaphor that operates on both levels. And I really like um, things that have more than one meaning. So it seemed to be um, it seemed to be a, a good metaphor. Weschler doesn't have the we have the slash between air and light. He's it's just called air light. We like that, you know, the slash, because then it also allows each of those words to, to operate on its own as well as in 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 connection with each other. Well, for someone who comes who has trouble with titles, I think you nailed it with this one. I, I love it. What does he think of it? I haven't asked him. Actually. You haven't. I, I, I need to ask. I need to ask him about that. We did publish. There's, you know, we we did publish the quote from his when we first launched the magazine, um, and I can't remember now if it's on the web, still on the website. I haven't looked in a while, but we did publish the paragraph, the passage where he explains what Airlight is, just as a kind of uh, as an indicator. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a beautiful metaphor for for California. It's interesting to me because you talk about and he talks about right this blurring effect right of California light that it but at the same time it can also shed clarity. So I wonder if there is a conscious effort on on your part when you're putting together either the big issue or those kind of mini issues that you talk about to have the right mix of stories and poems and essays that both blur and bring things into sharper focus. Like do you do you see that in the, in the curation? A bit. I mean, again, it's, it's it it it's always in our heads, or it's always sort of on the table. It's not um, over. It's not overtly conscious in the sense that we do want to be able to have that kind of intuitive flow. That sort of you know, we don't want to turn down a piece that's really great because it doesn't fit some kind of preconception we have. Um, one of our first rules, and we only have a couple, but one of our first rules was never make a rule you're not willing to break, um, because so you don't want to. You know, you, the, for me, it's really all about if I if there's a piece that is just so fantastic and we want to share it with readers, I want to make sure that we're going to share it with readers and not create a construct that will keep us from doing that. That being said, we're always thinking about those balances. So we're thinking about balances between emerging and established writers. We're thinking about, um, I, I can say, I think for the first six issues, certainly for the first five, and it may have been for the first six, um, we did not publish anybody twice. We wanted to basically establish um, a wide sort of contributor base before we went back to people. We're now starting to publish um, writers who have been in the magazine before. There are a number of people who've been published um, more than once. So we want to, you know, balance of people who are new contributors, who are um, who are kind of, you know, perhaps have, have contributed before, people who are uh, emerging, people who are established, you know, translated work. We're getting really interested in translated work now because, because we're an, a digital journal, we can publish work in both English and in the source language, which is a really, um, I think is a really important dynamic for us. And again, visual and, and 
even auditory in, as well as um, as well as text based stuff, and you know, and again, the kind of traditional and, and perhaps the kind of more experimental multimedia. So it's it's a matter of balancing a lot of different kind of um, of ideas and, and mandates, both in in terms of each big issue and also in terms of those little um, weekly installations. There's a certain, I think, meditative calm I, that I feel when I read an issue of, of Airlight. And I don't know if it's just the quarterly format that kind of helps me slow it down, or I feel like I have more time and space to savor it. But it's it's a rare feeling when consuming digital content to not feel like my blood pressure is rising or that, you know, think my, my heart's beating faster. Um, and I don't, um, it, can, it, can, it can just come so hard and fast at the expense sometimes of being memorable. So similarly, like when you're thinking and looking at a pitch, do you have that kind of thought going through your head of, is that intentional at all of like what you're looking for? It's definitely intentional. And I think it, 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 it emerges in a couple of ways. I mean, we are sort of, we are sort of avowedly non-timely, you know, I mean, if, you know, we, we will be time, I mean, you know, again, I, I was talking about that Wendy Ortiz essay, that was timely in the sense that it came out during the pandemic and it was talking about a kind of a pandemic experience, but it wasn't sort of, it wasn't news. There was, you know, no news peg. As I said, we don't really publish, we don't publish reviews. So when we publish critical essays, I would consider that to be a critical essay. They're often looking at a bigger issue. They're not pegged to something that's just coming out. We published a really wonderful essay that grew out of a craft talk that she gave by, by Marissa Silver when her novel, The Mysteries, came out about writing from the point of view of kids. But it wasn't her as a writer talking about how she did it, although she did that a little bit. It was also her going back into the canon, like talking about Henry James, other writers who had written books with young um, protagonists. So we're thinking in this way, um, in this kind of bigger converse, uh, let's say bigger chronological conversation, we're not necessarily worried about um, about being timely, about hitting something that's that's happening right now. I think that's the, the first part of it. And also we do publish long work. And so I think in terms of long work, there has to be a kind of um, easing up of pressure, right? If you're going to read a four or 5,000 word short story or essay, you may not finish it in one sitting. And so it better be, it better have enough, enough stuff going on to, to be able to reward you through a couple of sittings in some, in some way. Yeah, that's very gracious and generous of you to think about, think about your audience always of how, yeah, I mean, that's often, I think uh, publications can forget that. That sounds like I a strange thing that. to say. I believe that to be true as well. <laughs> I also should say from all the years of working for various publications in different ways I've learned a lot of things uh, there there are a lot of things I want to emulate and there are a lot of cautionary tales so I'm always aware of kind of what are the what are the best aspects for me of the publications I've worked on before this and what are the things I really don't what are the traps I don't want to fall into I should also mention quickly that you know one of the other reasons I think that it has that meditative quality is the design um, and the layout and and the kind of, you know, that part of it. And then for that, I have to give credit to our managing editor, Aaron Winslow, who is the basically the, the webmaster, the, the digital genius. Um, I mean, we had we had prof a professional design, but Aaron's the one who basically, you know, who sort of lays out all the pieces and comes up with all the images and the art. And so his kind of design sensibility, I think, is a big part of the way that the work um, reaches its audience or presents itself, I suppose, to its audience. Yeah, no, this is crucial. Um, so before we take a couple questions from our, our audience, David, I would just love to know um, how does this fit into, or are there other literary initiatives at USC? You know, I, I, I would imagine also USC becoming home, it's been 10 years now, right? Or at least of the festival of books for a lot of people like raise the profile of USC in a, in a literary way, but does, does Airlight fit into some kind of larger um, movement there? Yeah, we're doing we're doing um, over the last several years, around the time we started kind of developing Airlight, we developed a few other uh, a number of other initiatives, I should say that, you know, the PhD program has two micro presses, one is called Goldline Editions, and the other is called, I'm uh, sorry, Goldline Press, and the other is called Ricochet Editions, Goldline publishes three books a year, Ricochet publishes one, those are those are edited, you know, PhD student edited editorial boards on the faculty advisor to those presses. Um, and since we are now, um, since we now as I said, have those funded editorial positions at Airlight. The three, the two presses in Airlight have been talking a lot about collaboration and how we can collaborate both in terms of what we're doing in publications, but also in terms of events or, you know, real life collaborations, et cetera. 
Um, and then we also have two, we have a, uh, two, we have a, a, a literary prize, a mid-career literary prize that we've given twice. We're, uh, we just gave it the second time. At the, we give it right before the Festival of Books, and then we do an event um, at the Festival of Books with the author. The most recent recipient just a month or so ago was the poet Victoria Chang, um, who's a m magnificent poet and, just a, and also a fantastic literary citizen, um, but a really magnificent poet who's, who's really, her work has just sort of exploded creatively and really opened up over the last couple of books. And we wanted to, the prize jury wanted to kind of give her, it's an unrestricted um, cash award. And we wanted to kind of support what she was doing and also, you know, hopefully support some future work. And we, um, the first winner was a writer named Christos Ikonomu, who is a Greek short story writer, also a wonderful short story writer published in the U.S. by um, by Archipelago. And then we have a distinguished speaker series, which brings a big name writer to campus every fall. Um, we're, we're just starting to kind of schedule this falls, but previous participants have included Michael Antace, Zadie Smith, and last year, Natasha Trethewey, the former Poet Laureate um, and Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, um, they come and do a reading and um, and also then are interviewed by one of the members of the USC uh, English faculty. In part, this is a way, you know, this is all, it's, it's complicated in a good way. I mean, in part, at, given the university setting, a lot of what we're doing is student focused or student facing, let's say. We want to bring these writers to campus because we want the students to be able to talk, have craft talks with them and meet them. Um, but at the same time, it's also town and gown. And it's um, really about thinking about um with the festival of books as well uh, festival of books as well there is so much happening on campus and other there are other things that are not kind of under this umbrella there's so much literary production and presentation happening on campus that it really feels like we're you know we are kind of on the verge we're, we're sort of there's a it's a de facto center in a certain sense and that's really important to me in terms of front and center privileging literature and literary production as um as you know as the greatest thing in the world which is what it is so. you're, you're a little biased maybe but yes i totally i totally agree i love that phrase literary citizen i i want i want a stamp in my passport um for, love, for that i would love that to be my if i if i could have that be my nationality on my passport that's what i would do yeah absolutely well you're nurturing an entirely uh, a new generation of literary citizens with with all of that so that's that's wonderful so let's just take a couple of quick questions before you absolutely. have to run to class um one is just about like the frequency with which aerolite comes out and when is when's the next issue coming out and when can people expect it and how can they how can they um find out when it's going to come out so we're, we've actually moved to a three times a year model instead oh, okay. of a quarterly model just because it again with our with, with our small staff it was it seemed like a, it just gave us some a little bit of breathing room so the next issue will be launching over the summer we have not yet uh, we haven't picked a date. We're doing that in the next week or two, but we've got the issue pretty much put together. Um, so in July, the next issue will be will be launching in July, and we always announce it um, on social media about a week or two before the launch. We announce the we announce the launch date and we list um, the contributors. So keep an eye out. We are um, we are on Twitter um at air at airlight mag um, and so you know if you're if you're interested, check the Twitter feed. Feel free to follow us. We you know, we post when we post, but we always post about um, about issues as they're coming up. Great. And are there regular submission windows? Uh, uh, whatever. There, there, there. For a long time, our we we were just had open submissions. We closed them because we got backlog. So we are just about done cleaning out. Um, you know, taking care of all of the the backlog submissions. Then we will open up again. What I think we're going to be doing is open. In, you know, we're going to be three months on, three months off, three months on, three months off because that'll give us a chance to not get behind um, on submissions. I think one of the unspoken challenges of doing any kind of small literary publication like this is finding time to read all of the submissions. And um, and so we've been trying, we've been figuring out how to recalibrate our submission policy to make sure that we can do it in a more efficient way. Great. And our last question before we wrap and say goodbye is just, are you going to be um, featuring any excerpts potentially from forthcoming books or is it always original work? No, we we definitely have published excerpts. We um, and sometimes they're excerpts of books before they're published. For instance, we published a chapter from Elizabeth Crane's memoir, "This Story Will Change," before that book was sold. We published a chapter from Alex Espinosa's upcoming novel, um, which is coming out from Simon and Schuster, which is just sold to Simon and Schuster. Um, before that, you know, but obviously before that book was sold, and we do uh, also, you know, we published a. Um, you know, we'll, we'll work with publishers. We published an excerpt from Jim Lewis's last novel, working with his publisher at the University 
University of Texas. So we do publish excerpts. Um, you know, obviously they have to be standalone. It's tricky to publish. It's tricky to pull an excerpt from a novel, um, yeah. but there, but it can be done. Um, and so, yeah, we always have not always, but their excerpts are part are always kind of part of our mix. Great. Well, thank you so much, David, for taking the time during your very busy schedule to um, chat with us about Airlight. Oh, thanks, Mary. This was a, this was great. I really appreciate your uh, your, your your doing this. Yeah, and uh, to all of our viewers, we will absolutely be sending you the links to where to find Airlight and to all the many stories, including Lawrence Weschler's wonderful piece that was the inspiration for the title. I and it's called the, piece, the Weschler piece is called L.A. Glows, which is a yeah, great title in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely one of the classics. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us and uh, have a great climbing class today. Thank you. And thanks for thanks for this great conversation. Okay, bye, everyone.